Welcome to Lecture 22 of Physics 2 HA on the conservation of momentum. So in the last lecture, we introduced the concept of momentum, which was the mass times the velocity. And today we're going to talk about one of our most important and first conservation laws in physics that you will be introduced to in the two series. So the goals today, in addition to reviewing what we talked about last time, we'll first look at this first conservation law, the conservation of momentum. And then we're going to use conservation of momentum to develop a new way of solving problems that actually will help us create a lot of easy solutions to what were previously very difficult problems. So in the last lecture, I introduced the concept of momentum. And this came from a careful analysis using kinematics and, and Newton's laws to understand that when an object undergoes a force over a very short amount of time, and you integrate that force, as we see here on the right side of this first equation, this is called an impulse. And this is how we change this, pr this product, mass times velocity, of the object. So when something is suddenly hit with a large force over a short amount of time, it was impulsed, it changes this product. You have a final state, an initial state, and that state will change depending on the scale of that force. Now we called this product of mass times velocity momentum, and we showed that it was a vector quantity. So it has an x, y, and z component, and those components can be broken into mass times the x direction of the velocity, the y direction, and the z direction of velocity. And so in a more compact way, we write this down using vectors. So momentum is a vector, and we define it as mass times the vector velocity v. Now, as we show here in this picture, it can have components just like the velocity in any direction in three-dimensional space. And so often with the problems that we'll solve, we'll find that we need to keep track of both the magnitude of the velocity vector and its direction. And the same is true with momentum. Now, by giving this name of mass times volume, this idea of momentum, which we use the symbol P, we find that a change in momentum, so the difference between the final momentum and the initial momentum, requires that there was a force acting on the object over a short period of time. And we call this an impulse. Now, when we solve the final momentum minus the initial momentum, we have to remember that we have to keep track of directions. These are vector quantities. So we're not just keeping track of the quantity of the magnitude, of the, the momentum, but we also have to keep track of the direction that the momentum has changed. And you can actually write Newton's second law in terms of momentum now. Rather than the normal way where we said the sum of all forces, which are vectors, is equal to mass times the vector acceleration, we can now write this in the way that Newton orig originally conceptualized it, which is to realize that the forces, the sum of all forces, is equal to the change in momentum of an object. Now you can imagine in our example last time that when the tennis ball was coming in towards the racket, it had one direction of the velocity and its fixed mass. Now when the racket hits it, its momentum suddenly changes in a very short amount of time. And so this derivative would be very, very big. It would be a large change in momentum per unit time. And so that implies that there was a force that acted on it, which we know was the force of the racket on the tennis ball. So this is how Newton used his second law, and we're going to work quite a bit with this formal, formalism, so using the idea of momentum, but we also want to make sure that we connect the integral version of this, which is basically the connection to what we called impulse. So all of what we'll do in this course will assume that the mass is conserved. If we have mass that changes over time, we have to be more careful about our considerations, but in most cases, we'll keep the mass fixed and we'll try to understand how the velocities changed. Now, here's a basic problem that you can use to test whether or not you get the basic understanding of momentum. Imagine a ball, say a basketball, bouncing on the floor, and it's moving with a speed v at angle theta from the horizontal, as shown in the picture on the right. And then when it bounces, after it bounces, it returns with the same speed v, but at the same angle theta above the horizontal. So if you look at this problem, you can see that the velocity vector went from going down toward the floor to going up away from the floor. And therefore we know that the velocity vector has changed, even though the speed was the same. 
So if the velocity vector changes, then we know that there's a difference between the final momentum, that which is going kind of upward to the right, and the initial momentum, which was going downward to the right. So take a short break and try to answer the problem. What is the magnitude of the change in the ball's momentum? Now you have to be careful here because you have to realize that we're thinking about vector quantities. And so we have to keep track of both the magnitude and the direction. So now we can move on to what's called the impulse momentum theorem. And this is exactly what we saw before. And this is the formalism that allows us to understand why the momentum will change. And as you see in this graph here, if I plot the force on an object, f of x, as a function of time, if over a short period of time I increase that force so that it reaches a very, very high value. Now remember in the last lecture we talked about a soccer ball hitting a man's face. It basically increases the force of ball on face as I go through time over that short period of time. Now at the beginning we know that the initial momentum was p sub i x. It was moving in the x direction and there was some initial momentum. But we also know that at the output it had a very final, a very different final momentum. And it turns out from the force time diagram, we can take the area under that curve, which is this integral, and that tells us by how much the momentum changed. And so we can write down this quantity called the impulse, which we use the symbol J, and this is explicitly the integral of the force in the x direction with time taken from the initial point to the final point in time. So basically taking the area under this force time graph. And this is what we'll call impulse. So anytime we see that there's an impulse in a system, we know that there will be a change in momentum. But conversely, if we know that there was a change in momentum, then we know there was an impulse on the system. And we can write this in a very compact way where we can say that the change in momentum in its vector form is equal to the impulse that acted on the system. Again, a vector. And often we can write this down that the change in momentum in the x direction, for instance, is equal to the impulse in the x direction. And this can be decomposed into its y and z directions as well. Now often we can estimate the impulse. Rather than taking the careful integration of this complicated function, so the area under the curve, we can instead take the average. And so one way to solve these problems is to know what the duration is. So you know that, say, the soccer ball hits a face for a few milliseconds. And then you can estimate what is essentially the average force over that period of time. And this gives you a reasonable prediction or a reasonable kind of quantification of this peaked function, at least insofar that it roughly approximates the average force. But again, we can calculate this by finding the area under that curve which has units of force times time. So we can then use that quantity to find how much the momentum changed. So here's an example. Imagine the wall being impacted by a ball. So I first have a ball that is moving with an initial x velocity that is in the positive direction, and I've drawn here the, the velocity vector. Then I undergo a collision and there is a force of ball on wall, but an equal and opposite force of wall pushing on ball. And since we're considering the forces acting on the ball and the impulses acting on the ball, we have to be sure to include and understand that this is the wall applying an impulse to the ball. And then after that bounce, we would find that the ball is bouncing now with a negative velocity in the x direction. So we could plot this in exactly the way we would just set it in words. If I plot the force in the x direction as a function of time, I see that while the ball is in free fall, there's no force in the x direction. It's moving at a fixed velocity. But suddenly, the force of the wall on ball is negative, giving a peaked function over a short period of time that then goes back to zero once the ball has separated from contact with the wall. So again, the impulse is the area under this curve, and you see that the ball went from having a positive velocity to a negative velocity, and therefore its momentum changed from a positive momentum to a negative momentum. And you can plot this out by looking also at the momentum itself. If I think about the momentum here, I see that the initial velocity is positive and to the right, and so I have a positive value of my momentum in the x direction. But then I see that as I 
come into contact with the wall, my momentum has to eventually get to zero because my velocity is stopped when the ball is completely compressed at maximum compression. But then the velocity rebounds in the negative direction as the ball travels back to the left. And I find that once it's out of contact with the wall, it moves at a constant velocity again. Now you can see that this function, if I look at how it's related, it's related exactly like what we said. The momentum change, if I calculate the momentum change, it is exactly the integrated area under this curve. Now here's a simple example. Imagine you have a rolling cart of 10 kilograms and it's rolling now to the left, which we'll call the negative direction, at 2 meters per second. And we know that it's going to essentially bounce off the wall. Now the cart rolls, it comes into contact with the wall, and then has a final velocity of 1 meter per second going the other way. So now you have to ask, what happened in order for it to change momentum from mass of 10 kilograms times 2 meters per second to a mass of 10 kilograms now with only a meter per second. And the question we can look at is, what is the actual change of momentum of the cart? And this is where we have to be careful reading the signs. So the way to do this is to realize that I take the final momentum minus the initial momentum, but I keep track of the direction. So the final momentum is one meter per second times the 10 kilograms of the cart. That's this first term. And the initial momentum was a negative velocity of 2 meters per second times 10 kilograms, which gives me a negative sign, negative 20 kilogram meters per second. So when I take the difference of final minus initial, I see that I actually get a plus sign, and it gives me a net change in momentum in the x direction of 30 kilograms per meters per second. So this is one thing that often happens here is we have to keep track of the fact that the vector velocity is moving to the left in one case and to the right in the other. And that means there's an extra minus sign because the velocity has changed direction from a negative velocity to a positive velocity. And the answer here then is that it's a positive 30 kilograms meter per second. Now another way that the textbook will often show this or schematically show this is that you can use a bar graph to see that I can consider what the initial momentum looks like what the impulse looks like, and therefore I can guess what the final momentum will be. Now, I don't find this as intuitive, but it's certainly if it's a tool that can help you, you can use it. So here's another example that I want you to work on on your own. So imagine I have a tennis ball of some mass, 0 0.06 kilograms, and it strikes a tennis racket with a velocity of 30 meters per second to the right and it rebounds with a velocity of 40 meters per second to the left, the opposite direction. So basically this ball comes in, it hits the racket, it has an initial momentum, that is basically its velocity times its mass, but then it rebounds and it has a new momentum, its final momentum, which is a different velocity, but the same mass. So we're gonna ask several questions about this problem because some of them will look like what we've already done, but we can ask more in the next slide. So the first problem is, what are the magnitude and direction of the ball's change in momentum? So this is just like the cart example that we did before. The first thing you would have to do is realize that I want to take final momentum minus the initial momentum, and I make sure I keep track of my sign, and then I would get the answer. So take some time and make sure that you can solve that problem correctly. Now the next question we can ask is if the ball is in contact with the racket for six milliseconds, what is the average impact force on the ball due to the racket during this time? Now to work on this one, you should use the impulse momentum theorem. We now know from part A how the momentum has changed, and we know how to relate changes in momentum to the impulse or the force per times time or integrated in time. And so you can calculate what exactly that impact force must have been. So if you go back a few slides, you'll find that we have a theory for this, and that's the impulse momentum theorem. So again, take a few moments and make sure that you can solve this problem carefully. Now the last question you can ask is, how does the magnitude of this force that you calculate in B compare with the ball's weight? Now this is a really interesting question because it's asking effectively, how many Gs does the tennis ball feel when it's basically compressed against the racquetball. 
when it reaches that peak force of impulse that flips it and shoots it the, the other way out to the left. So you can calculate this by comparing the answer to B to the weight of the ball, which is mass times the constant G. So go ahead and take a few minutes and make sure, that, again, that you can solve all of these problems carefully. So now that we understand momentum and how to solve problems of changing momentum, which is caused by an impulse, we can now understand one of our first conservation principles in physics. So remember that the sum of all forces on an object is equal to mass times acceleration. And we can write that down as the time derivative of mass times velocity, which we now call the momentum of that particle. So most of the problems we've solved so far have been just like the force problems that we solved where we're using Newton's second law to understand the acceleration on an individual object. Now we can think about multiple objects and we'll see that we'll find some interesting consequences when we consider the momentum of several objects in an isolated system. Now the force from this description is just the rate of transfer of momentum. So this is another way to write Newton's law is that if I know that the momentum has changed at a particular time, over a particular time, then I know that a force must have been applied. And this, in fact, holds even if the mass isn't constant. For example, if you think about the, this version in special relativity, which you may cover at the very end of the Physics 2 series, we see that, in fact, it still holds, even though objects in special relativity are often moving near the speed of light. But if we take this idea that force is equal to the change of momentum with respect to time, you see that I'm basically just integrating both sides with time to get the force or the impulse momentum theorem. So if I look at an integral from zero to delta t of that force over some period of time, I integrate the right side of this equation, which is dp dt dt, and that's just the integral of the momentum, which is the change in momentum. So our impulse momentum theorem, again, is just another way of looking at Newton's law, Newton's second law. And it turns out that this change in momentum is the momentum transferred by a force in a time interval delta t on a single object. Now we, again, we defined using this the impulse, which is basically the integral of zero to de from zero to delta t of the force. And we see that if I look at the total momentum change, that's equal to the sum of all forces and their impulses on that object. So these are vector quantities in x, y, and z. And so you see from Newton's law, we actually get the whole entire concept of the impulse momentum theorem. It's more just like writing it in a slightly different way. In the end, momentum, we should remember in MKS units, is kilogram meters per second. And impulse, if you remember, is an integral of force times time, and so it must have units of Newton's second. And that's also kilogram meters per second. Now, let's think of an example where we can now start to understand multiple objects. So imagine we have two objects, A and B, each with their own velocity, so V sub A and V sub B, in real space, so multiple dimensions of space. And we can think about what happens before, during, and after a collision. So during their interactions, where these balls are colliding together, we know from Newton's third law that the force of B on A is equal and opposite to the force of A on B. So these two forces come from Newton's third law, and they're always going to be equal and opposite during the period of which they are in contact. Now, if I take this same idea that we showed just a minute ago, where I take the integral of this force, we can then see that this is an impulse. So if I look at the force of B on A, that's the impulse of B on A, and I see that it integrating the other side is the impulse of A on B. And that's just because we've taken this time derivative. So we could write this down just in our compact form that this, the impulse of B to A is equal to an opposite of the impulse of A to B. So the force that changed the velocity of A was due to the impulse provided by B. So you can imagine that that makes sense. When the soccer ball hits your face, your face is going to change velocity. And that's the example we saw last time. So the interaction forces between two particles deliver equal but oppositely directed impulses by Newton's third law to the two particles in any given time interval delta t. 
So as long as those two objects are in contact, their impulses are equal and opposite, just like what we said in Newton's third law. So now imagine, again, let's look at the momentum of two or more interacting objects. So if I drew a circle around these objects, and I said, I want to add up all of the momentum of every object in this system, I could basically do that. I could say the total momentum of this system is equal to the vector momentum of A plus the vector momentum of B. That is the complete total momentum of this closed system. And if I take a time derivative of that, so if I take dp total dt, it just equals the sum of the time derivatives. So I see that I have dp sub a dt plus dpb dt, which is basically just the time derivative of the momentum of a plus the time derivative of the momentum of b. But from our re-expression of Newton's law, we know that these are just the sum of all forces on a, that's what gives me this time derivative, plus the sum of all forces on B. That's what gives me this time derivative. But in this case where these particles are just floating out by themselves and nothing else is acting on them, I can write down all of these different components. I know that I have the force of B on A, that would be the first one in this sum, and I have the force of A on B, which would be the first one in this sum. But on top of that, I have external forces. So imagine that there were other forces acting on these. I'd have to add all of those external forces acting on A and all of the external forces acting on B. From Newton's third law, we already know that these ones go to zero. We just said that the force of A on B is equal and opposite to the force of B on A. And so these ones never contribute anything to this derivative of momentum. The only thing that contributes is basically the external forces acting on the system. So if we consider a time rate of change of a system's total momentum, so we conclude every object and its momentum in the system, then it equals the net external force acting on the system. So this is another really useful expression because it says that if I have a force acting on a system of lots of objects, it's going to change the total momentum of all of those objects. But conversely, if I have no force acting on these two objects, so imagine these objects out in space interacting and nothing acts on them, then I see that the time rate of change of my momentum is zero, which means that the momentum of the system is constant. So when I have no forces acting on this isolated system, I see that the total momentum of the system is fixed. And this is what we call the conservation of momentum. So what does this mean? If the total momentum is a constant, it means that if I look at the difference of momentum of one object and the other, that the sum total of all of their momenta have to be the same value. So the initial momentum of the system has to be equal to the final momentum, no matter what the consequence. So let's take a simpler example just to make sure we understand what this means. So imagine I have two spheres that are colliding in the typical way. One is moving towards the right with an initial velocity in the x direction of the first particle. The other one's moving to the left and they're about to collide just like say two pool balls or billiard balls would collide on a tabletop. Now when they collide, we know from Newton's third law that the force of ball two on ball one is equal and opposite to the force of ball one on ball two. This is where the impulse is basically coming from, that the force reaches a maximum when the balls are in complete contacts and they're undergoing basically compression. So the forces during the collision are an action-reaction pair, which we've seen over and over again. Now afterward though, in this system, we know that ball two moves out with some new final velocity, and ball one moves to the left with some new final velocity. But during this whole process, nothing else acted on these two balls. There was no other force coming from outside this world. The only forces were happening when the balls were colliding. So now if we take this idea of conservation, we can look at the change in momentum of ball one, and we see that it's equal to the force of ball two on one, that acted during the collision. And we see if we look at the change, rate of change of the momentum of ball two, we see that that came from the force of one acting on two. And that is equal and opposite from Newton's third law, 
to the force of 2 on 1, which we just said during the collision, these have to be true, that they're equal and opposite. And so now if I sum these two pieces, I take the total sum of the time derivative of the total momentum of the system, I see that it basically adds, just like I've written it here, the time derivative of this total sum. But we just said that in a system where there's no external forces, this, the sum total of all momentum, is equal to a constant. And so the force of two on one, you see, when we add it to the force of negative two on one, because it's a third law pair, we see that this time derivative of the total momentum is equal to zero. So the, here's the basic takeaway. This is the most important part, is that the momentum of Particle 1 plus particle 2, or ball 1 and ball 2, is a constant value. And what that means is I can group all of the final momentum, I can sum up all of the final momentum of the system, and it has to be equal to the sum of all of the initial momentum of the system. So this basically says that if I know the initial momentum of the system, I can find the total momentum of the system afterward because it has to stay constant. So the total momentum after the collision is equal to the total momentum before. And this is called the conservation of momentum. So here's an example that I want you to work on to make sure we understand this. So here's a sliding block. And there's a one kilogram box that is sliding across a frictionless surface. So imagine this block on the left is sliding across a table. It collides with and sticks to the two kilogram box. Afterward, the speed of the boxes is now some value. So you can imagine what would happen here. The small box would move and hit into the larger box, and they would probably move off to the right with some velocity. Now the way to solve this problem is to calculate the total momentum of these two objects at the beginning, and then try to estimate what the total momentum of this new object, which has a total mass, which is the sum of the two, and then find its velocity. So we're using the conservation of momentum by comparing the initial momentum, which is, has to be the same as the final momentum, just like we showed in this last equation on the previous slide. So go ahead and take some time, solve this problem, and make sure that you understand it. But I'm going to give you a couple other examples to kind of test our understanding of conservation of momentum. So here's a very tricky one. Imagine that I have a wrecking ball, which is just a ball on a string of length L. And it's a ball of mass M attached to this string, and it's released from rest at some angle, theta sub naught. So I pull the ball up, and then I'm going to let it go, and it strikes a, a balancing wooden block. Now the question is, and you need to use conservation of momentum here, is the block more likely to tip over if the ball bounces back off the block, or if the ball for instance, sticks to the block. So which of these cases would basically create a greater chance that that block would tip over? So we can say the choices are basically it bounces, it doesn't bounce, or equally likely in both cases. So now be very careful in solving this problem because you have to consider what would happen if the ball doesn't bounce, and so you have to look at its change in momentum, and then you have to look at what happens if the ball does bounce, what is its change in momentum? And we know that if there's a change in momentum of the ball that is large, then that means there's a change of momentum of the block that is large in the collision. And so this is a way to use conservation to basically solve how this will proceed. Now there's one more example that I want to give you, and that is a perfect example for Thanksgiving, which is the idea of an exploding pumpkin pie. So a disc, initially at rest, a pumpkin pie, is on a frictionless horizontal table and it explodes into three pieces, two of mass m and one of mass 2m, just like I've shown in the picture on the right. Two of the pieces move with equal speeds v in the direction shown. So you know the x direction momentum and mass of this piece, and you know the y velocity and mass of this piece. Now the question is, in what direction does the third piece go? Now if you didn't get it already, this is basically a vector problem, where you have to find the velocity vector of that third piece, and you know that its mass 
is basically just like it said. Two of the pieces move with equal speeds v in the direction shown, and it's of mass m. So try this problem. It's, again, conservation of momentum. All of the initial momentum that you add up has to be equal to all of the final momentum. And this is a vector quantity. So if I add up all the momentum vectors in the beginning, I can then look at how all of the momentum vectors should look after the explosion, which are these ones here. So go ahead and try this problem. Work very carefully because you need to find both the direction, but also the speed, the magnitude of that third piece. And your choices are basically listed here. So go ahead and use what we've talked about in the previous slides and see if you can solve this problem where you're using conservation of momentum, but for a problem where there's two dimensions, in this case x and y, of the velocities.